The normal TED format is you don't really talk about yourself. So, but the topic is uh, that uh, yes, yes, and me speak about is what obstacles have I gone through, um, and how have I overcome them if 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 they if I have or not, and, and what are the challenges are. So, I'd like to start off with my great grandmother. This is if anyone who knows what this town is. This is outside of Ir David. This picture was taken about a hundred year about eighty years ago. Um, Ir David is technically here, and this is an Arab, an old Arab town. And these are a series of catacombs that you can still see when you look out from Ir David. Uh, where Yemenite Jews who migrated from Yemen um, had no money and effectively the, the elders of the old city made them stay in the catacombs. So families lived in these catacombs for a couple of years until people in Meisharim paid for them to move into Jerusalem. So this is actually a great start of the obstacle. So obstacle number one is that my grandmother, my great-grandmother, actually sorry, my grandmother, uh, lived and grew up in a catacomb uh, because she had no money, uh, and they and migrated to Meish Arum uh, on behalf of some friends who paid for them. But effectively, th then what then happened is a bunch of Yemenite guys who had a lot of children that died during the famine in Palestine, for those who didn't know, uh, around 1910, 1905, um, realized that they had to move to America to have food. So even though they were in, in Israel and they were in the land of where they wanted to be, they couldn't make any money. So they all basically got together and they got on a boat and they formed the first Yemenite Jewish community in America. And the people who formed it were my grandfather and my wife's grandfather. Okay? So, and each of these members had many kids. My grandfather fathered 21 children, 14 survived. And my grandmother, my grandfather, my wife's side fathered 13 children um, and all survived. The, uh, this is the origins of the Yemenite Jewish community. And in fact, these people built the Yemenite shul in Borough Park. If you ever go to Borough Park, it's still there. And these families called the Adwar family and the Grandma family. But they came from nothing. They had no money. They had children that were dying. And they moved. This is the only suit they owned at the time. They took the picture um, and then they moved on. My father had this, my father grew up in an assimilated background. He's, his father was relatively successful. Um, he was a bit of a screw up in college. He was a jazz drummer, had a good time. Uh, met my mother, uh, fell in love, and decided to get a job. His job was the head of the Jewish community in Beverly Hills. So he helped set up the Beverly Hills Jewish community, and this is where we lived. We lived about a block off of this drive, uh, and it looked great. And then he made the grand mistake of taking a job running the Jewish community in Jersey City. So I just decided to give you a visual aid. This is in New Jersey <laughs> of Beverly Hills. So I moved when I was about a year old to roughly about a block away from this empty lot. Okay, so that is actually where I moved to. And then my father proceeded to try real estate development. He's a great man. He's a, he was a really, really great guy. And I loved him. He's like my brother. But he was a pretty bad developer. Um, and he went bust several times. So this is the house I grew up in. In fact, I didn't actually grow up in this house. I grew up on these, this set of four windows had effectively four rooms. I had a very uh, nice upbringing in many ways, but my parents really had no money. Um, I went to uh, Yeshiva University High School, um, which was called MTA at the time. Before that, I went to uh, JEC. And, uh, and I was in the, in the boarding school. Why I went to the boarding school? Because the neighborhood I grew up in was pretty bad. There was basically a mugging every day on my street. So my mother said, okay, you gotta get me out of here. And I went to high school. Um, anyway, when I was in high school, and uh, um, I would go to, to eat my food in my cafeteria, one day this lady at the cafeteria said, well, we got a problem, sir. You can't have any more food. Why? My father's check bounced, um, I think, the fifth time that year. So I didn't know what to do. And I was about 15 years old. Actually, I was about 16 years old. And I said, I got to figure out what to do. And I came home to my father. And I came home for Shabbos. And I sat down with my dad. I said, Dad, what's happening? How bad is it? Where is it? I just need to know. Tell me the facts. And we'll figure it out. So we have a copper pot. okay? And this copper pot held money. It held change. And my father took the copper pot, put it on the table, dumped it, counted out about $400, gave me 200 took 200 and he said, that's all I got. Okay, he said, that's it. He said, I, I, I have a deal coming in. I got this, I got that. Don't worry, I'm going to have more money. I'll help, I'll figure it out. And I said, I realized at that point in time, very clearly, it became, this is a quite important point of the comments today, I, it became very clear where I was at. It was very clear that we had no money. We were going nowhere fast. I had a lot of friends of mine who had quite a lot of money. They went to all these great sleepaway camps and everything else and I had the copper pot. So I saved this copper for many years, and then one day my father unfortunately threw it out, um, but it was a great symbol in our home. And at the end, when I walked away from that copper pot that day, I went back to my dorm room and I said, okay, what am I gonna do? 
So I started a business. And my first business I started was selling posters. My second business I did was start renting clubs. And the third business I did was start owning and running bars. And I did that between, I had to have a fake ID like my daughter now has, but then it was an EU license, it was a little bit more professional. Um, and um, basically I was running a club when I was 17 or 18 years old out of yeshiva. Okay? And that made me enough money to start thinking about college. So that's actually what I used to look like, it's a bit scary. Um, <laughs> That was my hair. Um, what's interesting is it's a fencing uniform. And this is another story about unsurmountable obstacles. During the time of the Soviet Jewry, when, when uh, we were trying to rescue a lot of Jews, and I was in high school at the time, we happened to rescue an individual named Stanislav Bardak. And no one knew who he was. He just happened to be a nice Jewish guy with about five other people. And the principal of my, Rabbi Taitz, who was a very famous man, was involved in helping him. And the principal of my school, or the rub of my school, got involved. And we rescued this for him, and he broke, took his family out of Russia. His name was Stanislav Bardak. When he got to America, and he came to the school, he said, I can't believe you saved me. I was going to a gulag. I really believe, you know, I was very proud of my Judaism, although I'm not religious at all. I said, what can I do for you? And so the principal of the school said, I don't know, what could you do? He goes, well, I could help you maybe teach fencing. Who is Stanislav Bardak turned out to be? He was a Russian Olympic coach of 15 years. Okay, he's the number one coach in Russia at the time, um, and he ended up teaching a bunch of yeshiva kids how to fence, and that's why we became the top fencers in New York State, and ultimately in the U.S., and which is one, I, when I, part of the way I got into NYU was I used to fence, so they said, okay, come and be on the fencing team. Then I discovered that fencers make no money, so I said, okay, that's over. But this was, <laughs> this was, that was his early, in there, so the early part of the year, I think I was a freshman then, or a sophomore, I thought it was pretty cool. Now, the next thing, so that so far everything's going okay, I'm pretty happy about, uh, about school, but I gotta figure out how to make more money because uh, college was costing money, I had to pay for part of it. My father kept bouncing checks. He was paying for part of it, but it was difficult, um, and I borrowed money, um, so I set up a business. And the business I set up was called, I don't have a picture of it, but I set up a business called New York Bites, and we, with a bunch of other guys in the, uh, and girls who were in the school all thought we were pretty smart, each had our own business. We were um, a sophomore when this picture was taken, a second year in college. I had a computer company which basically wrote software for people who just bought PCs, because PCs just came out, no one knew how to use them, um, and I set up this business to act as a consultant uh, and help write software. And the way I did it was I got all the graduate students who didn't know how to sell anything to write the software for me, and I would do it and sell it. The very faint, there's actually quite a famous story in my background where we got a job by Dime Savings Bank, which is like a building society, uh, to write a queuing program. And the way I got it done was we sold it to the company, we got the job, and we didn't have the software. We had a bullshit screen. The screen was phony. So the guy said, okay, you got two weeks to deliver it. So I said, what do we do? So I had this brilliant computer guy who was a bit of an idiot. He just wouldn't do it, and he was very lazy. So I locked him in one of my father's construction buildings, and I fed him over three days by throwing stuff through the window, okay? Until he was done. And then when he was done, we sold him, made a lot of money, and it paid for my junior year of school. So, so the point was, is that whenever there was an obstacle, you figured out how to overcome it. Again, unsurmountable obstacles. This is the great doozy of them all. This is my diploma. Now, what you don't see is a very nice diploma. Now, I graduated college, I finished college in 1986, and I was one of the youngest students to get into business school right away, and I got it into business school uh, below the legal age of drinking in Chicago, right? So everyone was seven years older than me, so I had to get a phony, I took the ID and I cut out the date, and I replaced that, it relaminated. Um, and I, all of a sudden, magically, I became 25, but at the time I was 20. But the problem, which is now to this day when I have investors, they say, well, wait a minute, hey, Mr. Breslau, we've checked your records, and you say you've graduated NYU and you went to University of Chicago, but NYU says you graduated in 1987, and you finished Chicago in 1988, so something's wrong, because you take two years for graduate business school. So um, I said, I have to explain it. So my father, many years ago, uh, unfortunately before he passed away, said to me, son, is there anything that we have a problem with? And I said, no, Pop, I love you, you're the best. He goes, you're sure? I, I screwed up a lot in my life. I didn't handle financial finances right. Is there anything wrong? I said, no, Dad, everything's cool. And then I said, actually, there's one thing that really pisses me off. It's the fact that my diploma is dated the wrong year, and my graduate, they, they, they barely let me graduate because my father bounced a check. So I was like, I didn't know about that. I would have paid it. The punchline was I did pay it, but they didn't give me the diploma. So I said to my father, go, Dad, I'm really upset by it. It's not that big of a deal, but if you want to do that, fix, figure out how to get my college diploma dated right at my graduation year, and I'm happy. No investor will ask any more questions, and I think we'll be okay. So I gave him my diploma. I said, see what you could do. 
So he went and uh, uh, came come, a couple months later, comes back, goes, hey, I figured out how to do it. Didn't exactly do what you wanted, but I got it close. So what he did is he used a sofa, the guy who writes parchment for a tells filling, <laughs> to cross out the seven and write six, which you can see here, which is really special. Right? So I, here I am, I'm underage at Chicago. Um, everyone's worried about getting jobs. Remember, this is 1987. For those who look at finance history, some of you guys are a bit young, 87 was a really bad year to get a job. Um, I ended up uh, being recruited at Goldman, which is great. I got a job at Goldman Sachs for the summer. Um, but then Lehman Brothers, uh, I, I had no more money left. I was running out of money. I borrowed about $200,000 in student loans, which was a lot of money back then. I went skiing. I'm a big skier. So I used that money to go skiing instead of necessarily paying for school. So I had to figure out what to do. And I convinced Lehman to hire me in business school in my second year. So I went to work in my second year of business school for Lehman Brothers as an associate. At this point now, about eight years younger than my class. So I've, I have lied about my age up until about 14 years, 10 years ago. So I've never told people the truth of my age, primarily because every time I mention my age, people go, oh, I don't want to talk to you anymore. So and then I started losing my hair, so it didn't really mean it much anymore uh, in terms of the years. The other interesting thing about obstacles is when I was at Lehman Brothers uh, in, in New York in 1988, um, I was approached by a very nice man, a very famous, very, a man who should be well regarded, to, uh, to work with him on projects. Now, I was in the real estate business at Lehman Brothers. And the projects were to do with Israel. He said, and he was 20 Jewish guys in a room. His name was Harvey Kruger. He's quite a famous guy, if you ever want to Google him. Uh, he's, he was the chairman of Hebrew U for a while. Um, anyway, he approached 20 Jewish guys. He said, we would like you to help change the face of Israel in a state of public markets in, the, in, in America. And we said, well, how are we going to do that? He says, well, we're going to take a bunch of companies public, and we're going to do all this stuff for them, and it's going to be amazing. And I said, well, why are we doing this clandestine? Why are we in secret? He said, well, the firm doesn't want to allow to do it. So Lehman Brothers banned people to do business in Israel because of the Arab boycott. We were afraid that the Arabs would shut us down. So I went back to my staffer, and I said, uh, I'd like to work on this project. Can I do it? And she said, if you do this, you will be fired. So I woke up to my boss, and I said, what do you think, uh, separately? And he says, um, I don't want to know about it. Do it at night. And I, ignored, I took the risk, and uh, uh, I worked on the first secondary offering for Teva Pharmaceutical. So anyone who's ever heard of Teva, Teva's the largest generic drug company in the world. Back then, it was a tiny company. It had one drug, which was called Copaxone 1 or COP1, and it just bought Lemon. Uh, and because I did that transaction, it was about, we ended up doing about 25 deals, Elbit, Elsint, Landata, um, Oh, Cytex, et cetera. We made about 30, 40 million bucks for the company that year. Lehman Brothers said, screw the Arabs. We're going to set up an office in Tel Aviv. Congratulations. And I was asked to join the Israeli team. I said, no interest. I'm going to focus on real estate. Um, I wish everyone luck. But because I took that risk, it led to an interesting fate. Five years later, I'm now a senior, reasonably senior person at Lehman Brothers, and Robert Maxwell dies. Robert Maxwell, for those who don't know, is a big fraudster. He borrowed a lot of money for Lehman Brothers. He was also the largest single private stockholder of Teva Pharmaceutical. And the security that he used for his loan was Teva. Since I knew the company and I was a firm's banker, I got sent to London to go get our money back. So I got here on the back of something I chose five years earlier. It's going to be a theme that you're going to hear in a second in terms of obstacles and opportunity. And then five years went by, so 10 years at Lehman Brothers. They say, come back to New York. You're going to run the division globally. Youngest partner ever at Lehman. Congratulations. I said, thank you very much. I went back, I looked at the job, it was terrible. I had two kids at the time. My wife's mother would interview me every year when I was gonna move home. And I basically said, no, I'm gonna quit and set up my own shop. Um, and I was scared, obviously, because I was in a mother ship. I finally made it, I had some money. I had a lot of Lehman Brothers stock, which is no longer. Um, and, um, and I said, okay, uh, Will, is it worth going on my own or not? And I took the risk with the, with the back and the support of my wife as my partner to do that. So these are our first offices. So I was, I was me, a secretary, and a plant. That's how we set a patron um, here. Uh, and we had a vision that I felt we could raise quite a bit, you know, we could raise money and make some good investments and figure out what we do next. So what happened, going back to obstacles, we have two and a half billion of equity today. We've done reasonably okay. Um, we've raised uh, uh, effectively four, five funds with the captive fund. We manage about 130 investors. This is a, for those, so a lot of people know who Patreon is. So just a big, big, very quick snapshot. We've got 70 guys in the management company. The yellow stars are our offices. Um, we've got 40 people in the investment team, ranging across all the different people. Uh, so thank God it's gone well. So now that um, I sorted out my parents, I raised uh, a fund, I have some money, 
I paid for, I took care of my debts. Um, my father's cool, my mom's okay, everything's fine. Um, what happens? Well, you start getting bored. So I was a skier. So someone said, well, why don't we go climb Mount Blanc? And I said, okay, never done that before, let's try it. So I climbed Mount Blanc and I promised my wife it'd be a one-time climb and I'd never do it again. Um, but then I got addicted. And I've climbed 48 major climbs uh, since then. Um, I'm just giving you a little bit, a bit of a perspective. Um, and this is just a list uh, of them. And in fact, Yossi and Mendy I invited to come with me. Oh, that is my lovely wife and my daughter, very nice. So then I did 48 climbs uh, uh, since then. And effectively, this was my challenge or the new challenge about uh, an obstacle that can be accomplished. So here I was, I felt genetically a classic Jewish male, big ass, not very strong, not very fit not really capable of doing any of this, I was just a skier, and I had to train and develop and do this. So just a visual aid of what this looks like, that's El Capitan, that's a two nights on the climbing wall, that's sleeping on the, on the portal edges off the cliff, that's a 900 meter vertical cl climb. It's that one, that's the old man of Hoy. For those who don't know, that's in the Orkney Islands, that's me. That's a picture taken by the Scottish uh, helicopters, which we ended up getting a picture of, and that's me taken by my friend. That's the Grand Jurass, this picture is taken there. Um, that's the Nuwa Pretory, which I did last year. Uh, this is uh, sleeping on a cliff. We ran out of water, so we melted snow, and then we got stuck, so we had to sleep on this little cliff wall. I'm wearing a helmet because rocks were falling. Okay, so we were afraid that I was gonna get sort of killed. Um, that's the, Matterhorn was actually the easiest climb, but that's the top of the Matterhorn. And that's Agilvert, which is, we climb this route and ski this face. Um, that's the top of Republic, which is there. And that's Papillon, and that's Grand Paradiso, and there's Yassi Vogel. Actually, I think that's Mendy as well, by the way. I'm not sure. I think you guys, this, this is the first day. So Yossi and Mendy came out. They said, we'd like to go out and climb uh, Mount Blanc. We're going to invite all these people. They're all going to come. He had apparently 14 people who apparently were interested. We did the lecture. There was about eight people. Then we did a second lecture. There were three people. And in the end, Yossi and Mendy showed up. And this is a picture of my daughter, Sophia, my second daughter who climbed it with me. And there's Yossi in the picture next to the Madonna, which is on the top of Grand Paradiso. And that's Kilimanjaro. This is my daughter who's here. She did when she was 14 years old. Um, and that's Ariane, uh, sorry, Sophia, who climbed, went to Everest Base Camp with me uh, this October uh, when she's 16. And this is one of the schools that we support or help, we helped build many years ago. And there's Sophia. So the message, which is a very important message about the mountain bit, is that it was a very, very serious challenge. It was clearly normally an obstacle that you, you, one cannot achieve unless you mentally put your mind to it. Um, I did think of it as a, an important challenge. I accomplished it, and then I convinced my children to get involved, uh, and then it became a great goal for them. Um, and they've done great. So my older daughter uh, just came back from Bravana's Yeshiva for six months and then spent three weeks in Chamonix, so uh, skiing. So that gives you a good perspective of how our approach is. Um, and then I got bored again. So we're somewhere in the middle of this, I got bored again. And I said, okay, I've accomplished that challenge. I need a new challenge. So we started putting a lot of time into charity. So this is obviously St. John's Wood Synagogue that I was involved in, CST One Family, um, some British-related charities, and some a recent charity which is called the Patron Armed Services Mentoring Initiative, which we set up to help British servicemen. Because one of the issues as a Jewish person in my company is that I only have five Jewish guys, but if you come to my office, there's mezuzahs everywhere, we have age classes, et cetera. And the question is, if you're not Jewish in my firm, do you relate to what we're doing? Or actually, do you feel almost biased against? So we decided to do a whole bunch of uh, activities for charities that relate to the overall um, people, and this is one of them. Uh, and one of the things I've done to that is I am going to kayak 90 nautical miles on May 21st between Sherbrooke and Portsmouth in this boat with this guy for 25 hours straight, um, along with nine other boats as part of a challenge to raise money for disabled Royal Marines. This guy has, is missing um, part of his legs. So the idea being is that this is a new challenge for me to do. As my wife said, when I took it on, she goes, yeah, here's a new challenge. You're going to be practicing all the time. You're going to be spending all this ridiculous time or doing all this crazy stuff. But I bought a kayak machine that's in my house now, and I get on a kayak machine every night. Okay. So what are the key conclusions? There is no such thing as an unsurmountable obstacle. It's all nonsense. It's, there's just challenges. The trick is how to overcome those challenges. What are, so first thing I ask myself is what do I really want to do? How do I want to get there? What is the opportunity that exists? And I may not see it right away, but I always want to take advantage of it. How do you build your support network, which is very important, of faith, family, and friends, which is really, really important. I couldn't do 
and, you know, almost all this stuff without my mother telling me how great I am all the time and without my wife saying, okay, I, I'm going to put up with it and we're going to work together to figure out how to get it done and my, and my kids. Um, and also, frankly, belief in God, belief in the Jewish God for me is very, very important in terms of perspective. That's why I, I brand everything. We have a patron yarmulke. Um, work hard, uh, believe, and aim high. My mother had this great expression, excuse my language, that was rise above the bullshit. There is so many people that will tell you we will fail. Most obstacles or most uh, perceived obstacles, okay, that should not exist at all. I hate people with negative attitudes. I don't like them being their friends. I don't like them being around me. This is all about positive thinking and positive way forward. And fundamentally, how do I want to lead my life? This is a very, very important question. And this is, to me, uh, Yessi asked me to kind of put some moral perspective in here is really, really important to how I make a lot of mistakes, but I try to identify uh, opportunity and work forward. Um, when I was 16 and my father gave me, or actually I was 15, and my father showed me that copper jar, I remember coming back to New York City, and I, is a, is a, if anyone has been to the Natural History Museum in New York City, Theodore Roosevelt founded the Natural History Museum. Theodore Roosevelt was an American president, and he wrote some great quotes, and this is his quote. I remember reading this quote when I was 16, and I pretty much go back every couple years to read the quote. I once made uh, Ariana, my daughter, read it. I don't know if you remembered it. I sent it around to my family. I think I'm nuts. But this is my, one of my most famous quotes that exists. A man's usefulness depends upon his living up to his ideals insofar as he can. It is hard to fail, but it's worse never to have tried to succeed. All daring and courage, all iron endurance and misfortune make for a finer, noble type of manhood. Only those who are fit to live who do not fear to die and are not fit to die who have shrunk from the joy of life and the duty of life. That is fundamentally my life, in a nutshell. So, in conclusion, um, uh, the purpose of the TED speech is just to give you a flavor of, of perspective. Um, I think there's, there's been, been a, lot, a lot of challenges. None of them I've actually ever seen as obstacles until today, and I put it all together. But that just gives you a little bit of a quick snapshot of, of my background and stuff that I've tried to overcome. Thank you.